Any time now, Sarah. Oh. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully, you've all joined in this morning um, for our natural resource management Q and A session this morning, um, looking at navigating regulation while undertaking earthworks on waterways and gullies on farm. So this morning, I'm Sarah Chapman. I'm team leader for Northwest Local Land Services, and I'm joined by Tim Watts, our senior land service officer from Tamworth. Um, and we'll be taking you through that topic this morning. So um, I'll just give everyone a second to tune in um, and we'll begin by um, an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my, my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So Tim, legislation and regulation. Good stuff. Big yep. topic. Um, often in our roles, we work with landholders who are developing projects which might com contain components of um, erosion management and earthworks. Um, and we might often be called on time to time for advice um, in managing erosion on farm. So particularly coming out of dry times um, and, and rain events, um, ground cover management, erosion management has been um, a, an important topic of late um, and we could talk for weeks probably on each of these legislations independently but today we are just going to use some scenarios um, to cover off some of the general legislation um, and examples um, and hopefully we can give everyone a good idea of what they need, need to consider before they get out there and um, undertake those um, tasks. So. Please consider any advice Tim and I give today as general. Um, our landscapes are very diverse, so you really need to consider any um, case individually. Um, so let's get cracking. Let's do it. So our first scenario today is um, what do I need to consider, Tim, if I want to implement a dam? Implement a dam. That's an interesting word, Sarah. We get this asked quite regularly. Now, my background is in soil conservation. Um, and I used to issue a lot of 3A permits for works in creeks and gullies and uh, certainly constructed uh, lots of dams over the years. When somebody says, I want to build a dam, I like to sort of drill down a bit. Now, you've got to use the word drilling down as much as you can. Now, Sarah did say that um, we, we give a lot, we, we, we're not a regulatory body as far as this, this goes. So. We, we, we give advice, but the actual regulation is separate from us. So we hopefully the advice we give is uh, certainly within all the, the permits. So an inquiry comes in and Sarah's got a friend who wants to build a dam. Looking down, it's probably actually Sarah that wants to build a dam. And what you want to try and work out is why do they want to build a dam is the first thing you do. And in your mind, in the back of your mind, you, you, you know what a dam looks like, but everybody's got a different picture. And I've got a feeling Sarah probably wants a dam to swim her horses in. Now, lots of people have got different ideas for what they want to do with a dam. We've built dams over the past for, um, for clients, uh, for sediment control structures. We've had um, dams um, for gully control issues. We've had dams for turning floodwaters. I even gave my wife a dam with an island in for Christmas one year. Now, so there's all sorts of different reasons and, and you've always come across a person that, you know, if they've wanted to build this dam for ages because they want to go fishing or they want to put the yacht in it. So different roles, different ideas. But just for example, say this person says, now I want to put a dam for stock water. It's a common one, okay? So then you sort of say, well, what's it a number of stock? What, what is it? And you find they want to do a feedlot. Well, that's a different different situation. But no, it's... um what you'd tend to consider a run-of-the-mill ordinary farm dam is what they want to construct. So the approach I take then is that um, what's the maximum amount of stock that you'd like to water from this dam in the middle of summer? And it gives you an idea of the size dam that they're talking about. Is it a puddle hole or is it a, um, a legitimate you know, sort of storage facility? Bear in mind, dams are pretty inefficient at storing water. You know, you look at the evaporation rate we've got here, which is well over a metre, um, and the surface area of a dam, 
um, the top meter can contain half the storage of the dam, and you can evaporate that in a year. So to try and get any long-term storage um, in a dam, is uh, you, you've got to be looking at a reasonable structure. So getting onto the drilling down bit, you start to say, well, if it is stock water you're after, had you considered other options, such as do you have a reticulation system? In which case, um, uh, if I was trying to sell water on a dam, if you've got an existing reticulation system, or these days, if you put one in and you've got solar, um, uh, solar options, you can get water to where you want it, um, pretty well straight away. You pay your money, you get your water there, and it's clean water, and then you can sort of move into grazing management, which is far more important than building dams. And with a reticulation system, you've got the option of spreading it about. We've actually built dam um, in, for people where they've been completely fenced off and we've put a fairly large solar system in and we've reticulated to a 100,000 litre tank up on a hill and being able to reticulate through it. But getting back to the dam, it's okay. So if they decide that, yep, they really do want to swim the horse in, or there is a reason for that for that dam and you can't talk them out of it and they want to go, go through with it. Well, then there's a bit of a checkpoint you go through. So you decided the size of the dam. So the first sort of checkpoint of the gate you go through is, is it within their harvestable rights? Now, harvestable rights have come about, um, I guess, as a, as a result of, they don't want people to capture all their runoff. You know, there's an idea that um, a certain amount should be allowed to continue down the catchment um, to fill up these rather large dams that get constructed on major river systems. But that's a different topic. We can go through that later. So. Um, harvestable rights uh, vary from area to area, but uh, basically it's 10% of the runoff that can be captured for on-farm use. Now, so you can get a figure if you've got 1,000 hectares and you know that uh, your rainfall is 800 millimetres a year or whatever, you can work out the, the amount of water that you can potentially harvest. From that, you deduct your existing dams, and you come up with a size. Now, I haven't come across too many properties that have actually exceeded their farm dams. Now, we did actually have a, um, a question came in, which is pretty good going, about Yeomans. And if you go back to Yeomans, um, uh, and he was actually an earth meeting contractor and loved building dams. And uh, on his initial uh, setups, uh, farms that he developed, he probably would have exceeded his harvestable rights um, in, in that situation. And he, he used to like to push the legislation a bit. But ordinarily, that's not an option. If it is, if it is, you may have to buy an allocation to, to be able to do that. So it's not that you can't go ahead with it, but there is other legislation that comes into place. Okay, so you're within your harvestable rights. So just on harvestable rights, Tim, what legislation does harvestable rights come That's under the Water Act. Yep, so Water New South Wales would control that. Um, also, um, the uh, Natural Resource um, Access Regulator would also have an involvement there. Silicon is another good. They have, um, they're have they able to work, work that out for you. Um, there's the maps of the particular areas, and so just a general inquiry, you can work that out. Usually not an issue. Okay, so then... Oh, come on. No, I was going to say, would would that dam, if it was to be constructed, constructed on a gully, would that need to take into account any extra... Now, you're reading my notes, are they? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, we've worked out that, that we, we can build this structure and then we want to know um, where you're going to build it. Now, in Sewell Conway's used to build things called gully control structures rather than dams. That was for another legislation because they were 100% tax deductible if it was work for gully erosion control as opposed to a, a water storage which was deductible over a longer period of time. But if it's on a dam, so a little slow chart going through, if that structure is to be built on what we call a second order stream and the Sprala order is a probably another, another, another topic. Again, it comes off the map. It's a relatively minor drainage line. If it's that or less, or if it's on the side of a hill, um, there's really no, no restrictions to building that as long as it's safe and not next to a main road going through and the structure is likely to fail and wash out the, uh, um, the road. Uh, there are concerns about where the location is. So we determined that, yep, they want to go ahead. So it's about this stage where we would have, in the past, in the olden days, we would have gone and done a property visit, an inspection, and we would have started with a cup of tea and scone. By oh, gee, we used to have good scones, but we don't do that anymore. So, <laughs> so um, just going back to that point, how does someone determine their 
stream would have been. Um, is that well? How in can, the past, we would have gone and we would have been able to determine on the land. Now you can go to a topographical map. It is available online. You can make an inquiry, and certainly we can check that out for you as far as that location goes. Okay, so you determine that the site is okay, that it's legal to build within your capacity, and then um, if, if it fits that bill that it's um, it's in that second order stream or less, um, and then you want to know whether you've got the catchment to be able to fill that dam, because if it's um, a relatively small catchment, there's not much point putting a large dam if it's never going to fill. So you've got to weigh that up. And I've always, you want the catchment, but you've also got to be able to have a decent spillway. So you've got to look at the location of the site to see if it um, justifies going ahead. And, um, and before you build it, it's also, and this seems a, a bit silly, I suppose, but it's important to know that you actually own the land. We've, um, we've come across a number of situations, particularly under, under power lines, where there's an easement um, or a crown road. Uh, that you wouldn't know looking at the land, but you've really just got to check the titles to make sure where that structure's going is actually your land. How's that? So we've covered dam. So I guess in summary for dam construction, considering things like harvestable rights, the location of your dams, um, yeah, the listing of your land, what stream water you're building it on. So there's a few different points in legislation you need to check in with um, there. Definitely. Okay. So if you were, say it was um, more than a second order stream that you wanted to build the, the dam on, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't do it, but you've got to apply for a permit to do it. And so first call there would be um, the likes of somebody like Chris Binks, who's at the Natural Resource Re um, Access Regulator, um, and you would contact him, and he would put you in the process of, 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 of going for a permit to do it and a license to build that structure. Okay. So we've covered unlicensed and licensed and who you go to for dams. So I think we've wrapped up the dam scenario. So let's move on to our next example. No, I haven't no, built my dam no. yet. Uh, <laughs> if I am trying to manage an eroding gully, um, I want to consider some ways in which I might be able to do that. Can I put rubbish in it to stop it eroding? Um, Let's start there. What what can I do to my eroding mm. gully and what legislation would I have to consider? Okay, so if this came up as a breach and EPA were looking at it, perhaps because somebody's gone and put semi-trailer loads of tyres in a gully or um, concrete or things like this that's happened in the past, they're first, um, they're, they're, firstly, they'd be lo looking at whether it's a first, second or third order stream as to which the gully is. Um, Often the gullies are right up the head of the catchment. It's a bit of a head cut going, and you're trying to get something in there to do it. Now, in the past, oh, there's some beautiful structures done with uh, cars, and uh, I may have done one with tyres that work really well, by the way, on black soil. Uh, but these days, there's um, there's a lot more requirements to as to what material you can use. And basically, concrete is out because they don't know what sort of impurities are there. Then you'll often see people will be putting old building material and things like that, and there's a lot of asbestos in that material. So you're really just not sure what those impurities are. And often you'll see people will tend to, um, uh, and rocks and things, they'll just put it at the top of the, the, the top of the, the gully. It's, and I'm not quite sure why they put it there, but it's actually aggravating the situation because that gully is eroding from underneath. So material, and if, if you can stick with natural material, um, the sort of thing that you don't mind if the person up above you in the catchment put in their gully and it floated down into your place. So, you know, household refuse is not is actually illegal. That's um, that's local government, I think, and these days um, control that. In the past, it was like a magic thing. You'd have this eroding gully. You'd put all your garbage there, and every couple of floods, it'd just disappear. Um, that's a that's a thing of the past. So, to answer that succinctly, Sarah, if you'd like. Uh, no, don't do it. So stick to natural resources. And what about what else can I do for my eroding gully then, or what legislation might I need to check? So if I have my own machinery and I want to go out there and batter the banks um, or do some um, management myself, what do I need to consider? Initially, I suppose, are you wasting your time? Um, Gullies are a, a, a bit specific as to 
you know, some of them have started because of um, access tracks, uh, stock tracks. Um, and if you don't eliminate the cause, often, you know, poor watering points and things like that. Um, you're quite entitled to have a go, but there's advice about, and um, I would strongly recommend you seek that advice first. Um, yep, you can use your own machinery, and there's a lot of things you can do uh, fairly easily, and, and, and rocks are a tremendous way to do it, uh, and, and a little bit of time and labour uh, put in place can go a long way. So uh, I would like people to actually try and uh, try things with gully heads because they do tend to just eat their way back and make a bigger a bigger mess of the place, uh, but restrict the use of, um, of material that you wouldn't like to see in your creek if the neighbour had put it in above you. Right. So Tim, who do I go to if I need to get a permit for that or does it come down to the stream order again? It comes down to the stream order. Basically in first and second order streams, which are just the one blue line on the topographical map um, and, and a first order, it um, is a first order until it meets a, a, um, another first order, it becomes a second order, but it retains its second order status until it meets another second order. And it's, it's, um, it builds up into a, um, a bit like a branch in a way. Uh, so a third order stream is actually quite a big stream. If it's a first and second order, now the legislation's a little bit wishy-washy here. You can, you know, you can put crossings in, you can do things um, uh, as routine agricultural practices in those um, areas. But the legislation actually says that you're supposed to keep away from the sides of the gully. You can build dams and things across it. Um, so as far as the gully work in there and bank restoration, uh, there's no no legislation required for that, unless okay. it's a third order. Okay, so just quickly before we go on to third orders and rivers, what legislation, where can people check what they can do for their routine ag activities? If they've got access to um, uh, um, six maps or uh, uh, information online, you can check uh, your, your stream order from there or um, certainly contact the LLS or the SORCON uh, are able to provide that sort of information. All right, so let's move on quickly to third order streams or an actual like eroding riverbank mm, um, mm. because we will know that once you get to third order streams or rivers, you will require some sort of permit. So can you just take us through what that would be or who you, who you would contact? What mm. legislation do I need to be aware of? Yeah. The third order streams, the third order stream is usually one that goes through a number of properties. And there's a certain amount of community benefit in doing works in, in streams. Uh, often they're very expensive things to do properly. You can have a bit of a half-hearted attempt and, um, uh, and try and do some works, but to do a, a decent job, you can be spending tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars doing bank restoration work, which is a great thing for people to do, but it's usually well beyond their sort of capability. It's the sort of thing that we, in the past, Sarah, the funding ferry used to be able to provide money to be able to do um, works in rivers, and it's, if if you're able to um, to get funding for the for these things, uh, it, it means that you can do a, a reasonable job with them. As far as legislation goes, a third order suddenly means that um, uh, Department of Fisheries are are interested uh, because there's a, under the Fisheries Act, even if it's a dry stream, there's still the, the, the mobility of, um, um, of marine um, ecology and things up and down th those areas. And so that's one legislation that you've got to get a permit for and get approval from. And then um, there's, uh, there's works in the creek, which is um, uh, with the Natural Resource Access um, Regulator um, under a controlled works permit. It used to be old 3A permits. But, but um, uh, if you're disturbing the bed of the creek uh, or the banks uh, with any machinery, you require a permit to do that. So just, I guess, in summary, when looking at third order streams or rivers, um, it definitely does um, touch on certain legislations and there's a couple there. There's the Fisheries um, Act and also checking in with the Natural Resources Access Regulator um, for, for the need for a controlled works permit. Correct, yes. Now what they'll usually say, and we've got a pretty good working relationship with both of them, and I'll get back to the idea that if you can get a project going, um, if, if we work with them, we don't require 
the permits, we get a letter of concurrence from both of them and work closely with Dave Ward is Fisheries and uh, we've had a lot to do with Dave over the years and, and Chris Binks, uh, again, if they know we're involved and we're overseeing the project, they're ca happy to go along with it. But if you're doing it yourself, it's essential to have those. In fact, if you're using any decent contractor, before they do anything, they will require to see that permit before they do any work. So we've just had a question come in, Tim, which is um, what permit is required for a bed sediment controlled structure? So is it does it come under the same legislation as a controlled works permit, or you know do you need to consider anything different for a um, bed sediment control? Hmm. Now, depending on what order stream it's on, if it's on a first or a second order stream, no worries at all. Now, a third order stream, that's where it's sort of, it depends on, on the intent of that bed control structure. So a lot of those ones, and this is what uh, Peter Andrews was very keen on promoting with these sort of leaky weir type of approaches. And a lot of, in many situations, they were just trying to, um, uh, to slow the water down and return the function that the creek used to have in the past. Now, as long as that's not going to be used as a pump site or a, um, uh, a weir uh, to try and change the flow of the creek, they're usually, and, and again, they're not built out of car bodies, but uh, you're using materials that are naturally occurring, uh, you're really simulating a sort of a, a natural uh, log jam type structure that, that you would get. And they're, um, I, I guess I, I'd have to say they're a little bit of a grey area, but as such, they don't really require any great licensing, as long as it's not being built with heavy machinery. So the, the Act actually says if you're disturbing the bed, that you require a licence. Uh, now, a lot of these structures aren't really disturbing the bed as much. If they need access to get down to build it, they do theoretically need a permit to be able to get down there. All right, so can you just summarise then, who would they need to go to? If they were checking with both fisheries if, and natural resources access regulator? Yes, they, you, you would. And what they may say, this is of minor nature, and so we don't require a $400 application fee to go through. Um, you know, if you explain the situation. Or again, if you go through um, the likes of LLS, uh, you'll find that um, uh, being able to get out and see the site, we may be able to sort of say, no, this is, this is actually exempt. This is okay to go ahead. So it's an interesting area where you're trying to do something to improve the, um, the ecology, the, the, the health of the stream. Uh, you're not actually trying to build something that's going to be used for you know, irrigation and what have you. Yeah. But I guess it's, it's similar um, for any third order. It's your Fisheries Act and Correct. your Natural Resources Access Regulator are your touch points for trying to work out if you need a permit or That's controlled correct. works permit. Yep. All right, cool. All right, so let's back off the stream a little bit again. If you were looking at doing contour work um, in surrounding areas, does that trigger the need to, um, you know, investigate any legislation if I want to do some contours? Legislation controlling contours, I guess. Uh, um, there's the if, if it's above two percent slope, it's regarded as as upland, and there's no real requirements there. Below two percent, it becomes flood prone land under legislation, and structures on on floodplains require they must be consistent with the floodplain plan, which um, is zoned in each area. So the, if it's if it's low sloping and can be seen to be influenced in floods. Uh, there, it has to be consistent with the plan, which could require a licence. Above 2%, depending on what the contour bank does. Now, um, we've, contour banks are a really interesting thing. They're basically gully controlled structures in, in the, the sense of the word. Now, to me, a contour bank is, um, a, 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 has a low grade and it has a drainage function. Initially, contour banks with soil con were put in level with the idea of retaining water in the catchment. And then with more cultivation, more runoff occurring because of the cultivation, uh, the idea was then to drain that excess water away. Now, a lot of them, the, the thoughts these days, and, and Yeomans was onto it back in the 50s, and um, Peter Andrews again, is, and the whole idea there is to retain water in the catchment and perhaps not have so much cultivation. So to rule with contours is that as long as you keep in the same catchment and you, you, you're conscious of where you're draining out. And in the past, it was always an issue because we'd try and have a safe disposal area. 
Now, whereas um, key line, we try and encourage water to go out on the ridges, which is a really good idea. But um, if you've got lots of water and it's concentrated, it can tend to create um, uh, scouring. So we were more um, conventional. We'd try and drain through into the lower section of the catchment and either and ideally have a waterway. But many landholders decided waterways were a waste of time. Uh, we've got a gully there, and the amount of times I've heard one gully is better than half a dozen, just poke it in there. And you know they were paying the bills, so you would drain the water into that gully. So our rule of thumb is as long as that water leaves your property where it always used to, and you didn't pick up a two kilometre bank and take it from another catchment and put it in a different one, then basically you could go ahead with contours um, uh, wherever you like. The, the rules are, that, well, not the rules, but as far as contour banks go, don't make them too steep. And broad base contour banks, particularly in black soil, are really the only way to go. You can build a narrow base bank very cheaply, but it's likely to fault out. And poorly constructed banks are probably worse than no banks at all because they'll concentrate, they'll concentrate water to um, particular spots, a stock track or where people have been over with a vehicle and break out. And there's more. Ready? And there's more. What, we're, what a lot of people are doing now is they're converting a lot of those, um, those structures into a swale type arrangement. Uh, again, trying to, like a checkerboard down the, the catchment, uh, down the, the small catchment, so they're holding water up in that catchment. Uh, again, don't just do it ad hoc. You've got to try and make sure that where you're spilling water out, because it's they will fill up and it'll overflow at certain times, that it's not going to concentrate and build up to a such an extent that it's going to blow out. So you you move them about a bit and so you can stagger it. But the old, whole idea, and really good um, until you start cultivating, and then there can be big issues with wet patches and things like that. So just to summarise contours or swales then, who can people go to for help if they need to check their design or check if it's impacting on any legislation? SoilCon is a resource, I guess, there. Um, is there anyone else they need to talk to? Their neighbours. Hmm. Very good idea just to check with your neighbours to tell them what you're doing. But legislation on swales, no, there's not really. Again, as long as you're not um, pinching somebody else's catchment, uh, it's another one with dams that we didn't mention, and we get quite a few about, um, the bugger just up above me, he's put this bloody great big dam in, and I'm going to lose all my catchment. Um, and that's another interesting one because, yeah, you, as long as you're within your house will rights, you can, you're able to do that. Um, so, yeah, condo banks is not really, so as long as you're above the 2% and you're not, where you're draining the water isn't creating a problem, um, condo banks are pretty, pretty straightforward. I, again, I would thoroughly encourage the people, if they're interested in it, they're new to the, to the area, they've bought a new property and there's existing layout there, they're not sure what's going on. My first port, port of call would be the local soil con to come out um, as an advisory visit, uh, free, free charge, come out and just sort of say, what's going on here? Mm. Or by Sarah and get an LLS person to come out. All right, we'll move on from contours because we're running short on time. Um, quickly, here's a quick one. Extracting gravel from a creek. Can I do it? Now, uh, um, Theoretically, uh, you are able to use, for on-farm work, uh, you can take gravel out, but it still requires a permit, okay? So, um, and that's under the Natural Resource Access Regulator. It's called a controlled activity, and they want to know how much you're going to take out and the location you're going to take it out, and also the way you're going to do it, because they don't want to leave holes in the creek and, um, and areas. Um, if, you, if there's any sale going ahead, well, that becomes a completely different issue. You have to have a statement of environmental effects and go through a lot of legislation uh, to, to be able to do that. But they're really trying to remove um, people from the creeks because the gravel that they're removing is an essential part of the river ecology. Fascinating stuff. And uh, so I guess if I, in a short answer to that, with, uh, unless you have a permit, no, it's not, which is interesting because people go down and do it all the time. Yeah, so that's just to, to check yeah. then, Natural Resources Access Regulator, Chris make Beach. sure you be um, really happy <laughs> get a permit. Um, do we have time for another quick one? We're, well, we're on our half an hour now. Uh, just another common one that comes up all the time as well, Tim, is um, removing casuarinas. And you want to answer that in what, how long? Give me the really short 30-second version of that. Don't do it. How's that? 
if they were willows, and you could cut them off at, at, without disturbing the creek, because it comes back to the, the disturbance of the of the bed of the creek. If you if, if you can do exotic plants without disturbing the bed of the creek, you don't actually require a permit. But um, casuarinas uh, are a native species. They're there for a reason, and the next flood will determine which one should stay and which one shouldn't. Oh, thanks, Tim. So we are running short on time, so let's just do a quick revision of some of the legislation we've covered this morning. So first of all, we've covered the Fisheries Management Act. Um, so that covers, you know, you might need a permit, um, controlled activities. Uh, we've also talked about the Water Management Act, um, and that covers things like harvestable rights and controlled activities. Um, and we've spoke a lot about the Natural Resources Access Regulator, and I've tried not to use acronyms <laughs> while we've gone through the last half an hour. So that one's really important. Yeah. Um, they're an important contact to have. Um, and then I guess the other one, which we didn't speak specifically about, but was the Biodiversity Conservation Act or Land Services Act. If you are looking at removing certain types of vegetation, you do need to consider what vegetation that is. Is it threatened um, and or what the classification of your river or creek might be as um, is it exempt or vulnerable land? Um, we've talked a lot about stream orders. What else have we covered? Quite a bit of content in the last half an hour. So. Mm -hmm. Um, what we will do, um, we will so sign we off. We, did. we will sign off with a um, list of links to go to for more information and further advice, um, and that will include some um, fact sheets. And we will also put up some local contacts for fisheries, for natural resources access regulator. Tim's phone number will be up there as well as um, SoilCon. So as we wrap up, you know, we've spoke a lot, we do a lot of this work in relation to our projects um, and landholders looking at undertaking erosion controls. So just a reminder, we have open at the moment our Check Ready Grow program. Um, if you are interested in grants or funding for undertaking works on farm, jump on our website or um, follow our um, Facebook and you can find some links and information to our uh, incentives round, which is currently open. So thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, Tim. Um, get in touch if you have any questions um, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you. Coffee time. <laughs> and do you really want me to do another one? Cut your cheek. <laughs> if you only be able to cheat if you want to.